Well, on behalf of Financial Women of San Francisco and Haas School of Business, I want to welcome all of you to this evening. We have an all-star cast tonight, so we're just thrilled that you could be a part of this. And, um, you know, a, our organization really appreciates you being here. Um, my name is Sue Mazzetti, and I'm the Vice President of Programs for Financial Women of San Francisco. And I want to first uh, thank, send out a huge thank you to a number of organizations within Haas that have helped to co-sponsor this event. Um, the Center for Equity, Gender, and Leadership, um, the um, Center for Sustainable Business, and the Women in Leadership Club. So I think I should start by asking all of those who are somehow affiliated with Haas to please raise your hand. Faculty, look at this. Faculty and students, thank you for being here. Next, I would ask that if you are a member of Financial Women of San Francisco, can you please raise your hand? Terrific. And thank you to all of our guests who are here as well. Um, I'd like to just spend a minute telling you a little bit about Financial Women of San Francisco. Um, I also want to point out that um, we have a number of our board members here this evening who are distinguished by a red star on their name tag. So I encourage you after this event, um, if you're interested in learning more about our organization, to please find someone who's got a red star or see my good friend Carrie in the back here. Um, she has a table set up outside as well. Um, so our organization is a community of more than 300 women um, who have the mission of advancing women in finance. Um, finance is really broadly defined for our organization. So that's everything from people who work in the financial industry, so in asset management, investment management, um, hedge funds, banking, et cetera, um, but also those who uh, work in financial functions um, outside of the financial industry, so controllers and CFOs and um, a whole host of um, uh, different um, uh, functions are represented. And, and then we also have um, those who dot their line to the financial industry, which may be attorneys and um, consultants. So um, I would venture to guess that anyone who's in this room somehow can find themselves a, a, as a potential member of our organization, that you'd be well-defined that way. Um, as I mentioned, we, uh, we've been around for over 60 years, some very courageous women, uh, a small group of women uh, formed our organization, and we've carried on their mission of really trying to pay it forward. Um, and we do that um, really through three pillars to who we are. Um, first, we put on some what I think really phenomenal uh, thought leadership events, like what we're experiencing here tonight. Um, our events range everything from industry leadership, what I, which I would call you know, a night like tonight, where we're able to bring in um, some industry leaders and talk about a really progressive topic, um, to professional development events, where we're working on a particular skill set, whether that's how we leverage social media for our business, or or uh, hone in on our presentation skills. Um, and then, of course, we have lots of opportunities for networking through a number of other events that we put on as well. Um, you know, networking is extremely important. It's really the second pillar to our, our organization in, in allowing us to really um, support each other, collaborate with each other, find mentors, find good friends, and just really enjoy the community that we've been able to put together um, and bring together through this organization. Um, and then the third piece, which I say last, but it's really the most important, is our philanthropic mission. So over the past more than 20 years, our organization has given out more than $2 million in scholarship to women, both at the undergraduate and graduate levels that are pursuing degrees with the intention of going off into finance. So I'm going to ask you to clap with me for that. 
This past year, we actually awarded over $160,000 to 13 well-deserving women, um, four of which are, uh, are women who are pursuing degrees here at Haas, both at the undergraduate and graduate level. So um, we've been doing events at Haas. This is our third year. We have a very strong partnership um, with the school, and we're so thankful um, that they continue to collaborate with us. Um, but I'm going to now turn to our wonderful moderator and panel. Um, tonight's event is being moderated by Kelly McElaney. Um, she is on the faculty here at Haas, as well as the founder and executive director of Haas's Center for Equity, Gender, and Leadership. And she'll tell you a little bit more about that. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here, and we're really excited for this partnership, as Sue said, and to host this panel, which is incredibly amazing. And they look at the color scheme. That was just, <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, so Power I want to start by, by saying a few contextualizing words. And I want to tell you, I've been here at the Haas School of Business since 2002, which feels really horrifyingly long. Um, I actually started the, the center that's up on the right, the Center for Responsible Business here in 2003. And then fast forward, we had our two-year birthday last night for the Center for Equity, Gender, and Leadership. So all four of us had dinner at my house and uh, <laughs> celebrated you know, the startup mode. We, we did the Enneagram and the five love languages at work. Um, anyway, enough about that. So the Center for um, Equity, Gender, and Leadership, we launched it two years ago, as I said. And we have a really simple mission. And that is to educate equity-fluent leaders to ignite and accelerate change. And we developed this, this construct called Equity Fluent Leadership, and I'll get into that in a moment. But we graduate here at the Haas School of Business over 1,000 leaders a year. That's th across of all of our degree programs. So our very straightforward mission is to graduate over 1,000 Equity Fluent Leaders a year. We developed this construct because we, we, our first and foremost business here is to develop leaders. We decided to get away from the diversity and inclusion language for a whole host of reasons. We wanted to elevate it into, this is, this is about leadership, particularly in today's world. So we define equity-fluent leaders as leaders who understand the value of different lived experiences and courageously, and I really work long and hard on, on how do you, we have been complicit in silence, I think all of us leaders in many ways, um, and courageously use their power to address barriers, increase access, and drive change. Really excited about that. Um, some things that we are doing, we have equity fluent leadership playbooks that we're producing. Our first, Genevieve and Ishita, my team members, and Jennifer are in the front row. Jennifer hates to be called out, so I learned this last night, so I'm gonna call her out. I'm not gonna make you stand up and talk. Genevieve likes gifts, here's a gift. Uh, anyway, Genevieve and Ishita have just put out their first playbook, and it's around dual career couples and things that businesses can be doing to support specifically dual career couples. Working on one right now around bias in AI, and I sadly don't, shouldn't joke that it's gonna be an extraordinarily long playbook because of what is happening in the AI industry. Probably one thing that would be most useful to all of you, and these are all freely available on our website, is we did a 10-year scrub of research that correlates diversity and inclusion, companies who score high on diversity and inclusion, and business return. And so we don't give you the 10,000 pages of the articles. We link it, but my team did a great job of saying, here's what this article will tell you. And they tranched it, put it in tranches by financial return, return on talent, return on innovation. So it's a fantastic. So you know what, what we heard from our board members, uh, Larissa's not here tonight. She's, she's at every event. Uh, she's a bond trader at Dodge and Cox, one of my investors. And um, she said, if one more person asks me for the business case for diversity and inclusion, I'm going to throw something across the table. <laughs> so maybe you could produce something that we can just hand them. So we, we do do that. And I don't want to talk more about the center. Um, let's contextualize where we are around boards, um, particularly in the state of California. I will try not to talk about WeWork, which just did an IPO with zero women on the board. And then we know where that went uh, with Adam. Newman smoking pot on his plane next to his colleague who was pregnant. Um, but we know that the state of California passed SB 826. California is the first state that mandates that for companies who have their executive offices here that they have women on boards. Uh, the, there are 445 public companies here in California that have 
zero women on the board. If you look at the Fortune 500, 22.5% of board seats are held by women. Uh, but let me just talk about that. 22.5% underrepresented women, 4.6%. And we continuously talk about these statistics addressing white women, so I want to always call that out. There are good news, that's the, that's the reality, um, but some good reality, there are uh, companies that have more than half of the board seats being occupied by women, just to, to name a few, GM, Bed Bath & Beyond, and Viacom. And companies who have reached 50%, Williams Sonoma, Best Buy, and Ulta Beauty. So there is good news out there. And now let's turn it over to the good news. I have Joan Day sitting here on my left. She's a managing director with uh, Beckwith Investments. She serves on the board currently for Cineplex and Charles Schwab. I should, should know that because Carrie Schwab is an investor in our center. Um, but she's served on multiple boards previously, so she'll talk about that. We have Sabrina Simmons, who was formerly the CFO at Gap Inc, and it's been a completely quiet day for Gap Inc on the market today. We know that. Um, she's one of our alums. We're really proud to say that about her. She serves on the board currently for Columbia Sportswear, Elf Cosmetics, and William Sonoma. 50% uh, women on that board, so congratulations. And then finally, we have Robin Washington, uh, Go Blue. We both went to Michigan, so have to shout out to that. We're still at a blue and gold University. So nearby, yeah. <laughs> a little bit different Girl, football, blue, football team performances. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she is the CFO of Gilead Sciences, and she serves on the boards of Honeywell um, and Tektronics, and then the other one, MIPS Technology. No more. No, no. Okay. So I'm on Honeywell, Salesforce.com, Salesforce. and Alphabet, and just I. I Just was a few. Um, small company. Yeah, yeah a large company. But also, I was the CFO of Gilead up until November 1st. So, oh. um, so oh. just last week. Well, congratulations. congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. No wonder you're smiling. <laughs> and uh, her daughter, Kendall, looks step. in the front row. Yeah. So, I want to give a shout out to oh, a, a, a woman who will be on a board very yeah. shortly. So I'm going to turn it over to, to you all. Anything else about your introduction that I might have messed up on or that you want to add to it? Elf is also 50% women. Oh, nice. Okay. As it yeah. should be. It's a beauty company. So Fantastic. My God, and Ulta. My goodness. Yeah. Nice yeah. to hear that. Two of my three boards have three women on them, including me. So I think that's always a good number to at least uh, start yeah. if you can't right. get to 50%. Right. So mm -hmm. making progress. Mm -hmm. yeah. Excellent. And I know you were out without power for a significant amount of time. You were too, yeah. so you're happy. You were, we're too. Happy to be. Two days, but oh. yeah. And, I, and I'll also say that I invited my daughter, but she didn't come. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad you're here. Relish it at this age. Just like those college-age daughters. Relish it. <laughs> then they, yeah. Okay, let me start out. What was, um, what is, what was and is currently still your motivation for serving on boards? So what, what were you sort of motivated by? Well, maybe I'll start. Um, you know, fundamentally, I'm interested in complex problems. And uh, I've spent my whole career, I've maybe a little bit more of my background with the Boston Consulting Group and then a senior executive in a big financial institution, BMO, BMO Financial Group, solving really complex issues. And uh, when you step away from that and uh, changed course, um, I wanted to still be in that realm. And so solving those complex issues, um, people, being with really interesting people to solve those issues is very, very important to me. And I do, it wasn't a primary motivator, but it was in my mind to take the responsibility of sitting at that board table. It's really important to have our voices, diverse voices, at the table, and it can make a difference. And so it wasn't the primary motivator, but was at the back of my mind. Wake up every day and want to solve complex problems. We need you in the world today. There are just a few. Um, Serena, how about yeah, you? Yeah, I mean, I think similar to Joan, for sure, is um, I try to live one of the principles of the Haas School of Business, right, which is students always. Mm -hmm. And so I definitely love, I'm super curious. I mm -hmm. love learning. And one of the, my, probably my biggest fear when like, you know, Robin just took the plunge when I decided to stop working full time was like, oh my God, I'm not going to be in the flow. I'm not going to, no, 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 I got to stay in the flow. And so, you know, boards are a terrific way to stay mm -hmm. really current. And, um, you know, again, as Joan said, 
you get to sit usually with, you know, if you're lucky, most boards are high quality, really high quality people. You get to learn a lot. And hopefully, because it needs to be a win-win, of course, you get to contribute a lot. Because, you know, we've all had been working most of our lives and have had lots of different experiences. So it's nice to give back that way, too, mm -hmm. and really create that, that nice win-win. Yeah, wow, lots of similarities. Um, I also am a continuous learner and having worked abroad and in large companies, I too like big, hairy, audacious, <laughs> complex problems. But the, I would add, Kelly, that I would say fortuitously, I kind of fell into board service slightly different in that um, when I was um, a corporate controller, um, the CFO that I worked for sent me to a women on boards Mm -hmm. seminar for development mm -hmm. and it was really done more to help me develop how to better support our board because I took mm -hmm. on a lot of the responsibilities of supporting the audit committee um, and the audit chair and it was the audit chair that said hey you know you're doing really well at this yet we were in the midst of a hostile takeover so mm -hmm. there were some really complex things that we were dealing with and he nominated to me a board so I actually um, joined a board, um, Tektronics, before I became a CFO. Mm -hmm. And I would say then becoming a CFO, it was very helpful for me in stepping back, seeing things strategically. Um, when I ultimately, so I was a CFO of a tech company, when I ultimately moved to Gilead and Biotech as the CFO, I, um, after mastering that job five plus years, I really thought about board service as a way to keep me to connect it mm -hmm. to technology. Um, but also, I think the C-suite jobs can get a bit lonely in terms of continuous development, looking at things differently, and similar to my colleagues here, the opportunity to interact and, and work with people, collaborate with people that you only see every few months, um, um, strategic thinking, working through some complex problems for different industries. It was helpful in terms of what was alike and similar relative to my industry, but I also think it allowed me to continue to develop, develop relationships, but to continue to develop as a CFO and how to think about strategy mm -hmm. and things that I can take back. And I only say that because I think it's helpful to think about board service a little earlier in your career yeah, um, before you retire now, yeah. because mm -hmm. I, I do think the needs of companies are evolving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What, so how many days into retirement are you? Four days? Uh, yeah. Well, I'm actually, yeah, I'm still still um, advising until March 1st, but yeah, I have a, it's busy. Yeah. yeah. Why don't I, because you mentioned this, Robin, it sounds like you had a sponsor in your life who put you, mm -hmm. you know, forward and said, you're ready, let's, let's put you out there. Any other um, just thoughts on how you got onto boards, the process, what it looked like? Yeah, like I said, this, I would say, um, it's a whole different vetting process, and I know we talked about this in prep for this panel, and that I think your resume and your background has probably been vetted even before you get the call, um, but it then becomes fit. But clearly, um, uh, you know, your background and your experience and having sponsors, I think recruiting firms do some of the work, but a lot of it is through networking mm -hmm. and knowing people. And, and back to your point, Kelly, on diversity, I think the reason why I think it's important that we look at panels and they have laws and things is that for the longest time, I think board work was primarily done by CEOs or other C-suite executives where you don't have as much diversity. And I think um, as people think about the value, the business cases, it becomes more important to think broader. I also think skill sets and, and desires and needs of boards are changing such that if you think about cyber, if you think about all things, so having the right skill set, the right opportunity, putting yourself out there that you're interested in a board, I do think this is an awesome time where mm -hmm. the way people think about board capabilities is being expanded and broadened than the way it used to be. Mm -hmm. okay. The job description has got to broaden. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I wanted to just jump in on that. You know, I think back to my first board, I was a senior executive at the time. Uh, 13 years ago, mm -hmm. and, and I actually still sit on that board, Cineplex, um, and that was through relationships, and my second board was through relationships, mm -hmm. and um, one it had been a referral or recommendation from a past client, and the other one had been a client, mm -hmm. 
And, um, you know, those relationships, they called me both completely out of the blue. But just, you know, every time you're, it's the good old advice we've all had every time you're interacting with anybody, building those relationships and maintaining them and just keeping them up, are, are, it's very important. Things have shifted. I would say at that time, I don't think I was called at all because I was a woman, and I hope now I don't get called because I'm a yeah. woman. But I do think as people are more focused on diversity, things have shifted and headhunters are being, search firms are being used much more. And so people that are actually in the window or you're interested, I would, I would reach out to the search firms and let, you, let them know you're interested because there has been this shift. Um, having sat on nominating committees before, people were really talking about diversity, unfortunately. Um, you know, there was such a sense of, well, who do I know? We need somebody, who do I know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, thankfully, the boards and companies that I'm involved with anyway, we've moved way beyond that. Um, and understanding that there's this sometimes disconnect between the supply and the demand, and that there's some really good people that maybe aren't in our immediate network. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah similar experience. I mean, I got, I, I got on Williams-Sonoma's board when I was still CFO at Gap, and I got tapped because the chairman of Williams Sonoma sat on the Gap board for you know many many years, and left the Gap board and then tapped me because he saw how I interacted with the board for a decade, and he felt really comfortable that I could contribute to the discussion at a similar company, um, you know, help support and mentor, if you will, their CFO, et cetera. So that one definitely you know came through relationship. Mm -hmm. And then, um, interestingly, at Columbia, I got the call because a former banker had recommended me um, to their CEO. And so he gave me a ring. And so it is really happens sort of fluidly mm -hmm. and authentically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes you get, I, I, think, I think search firms are getting much more involved now. And I agree with everything that the dynamic luckily is shifting. So it's not just C-suite people mm -hmm. that are being called upon. But I do think it's critical um, to get some exposure to the board. Because yeah, what I do hear a lot in conversations when we're talking about bringing on new board members mm -hmm. is people really tr shy away from people who have never had exposure right. to boards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's kind of like getting your first job. Everybody yeah. wants someone who's had a job, so it's really frustrating because you can't get your first job. Right. But, 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 but to, to at least get exposure and to in some way be able to convey that you understand what a board is there to do, because you know, not everyone Sometimes. does. Mm -hmm. And to understand um, governance, and these are really important issues because, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about later, I can't imagine a board where a business doesn't come upon some challenge. Mm -hmm. And then you better understand governance and mm -hmm. like, what do you do? It gets sticky and you better, you know, know your way around and have those relationships. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I think there's many more ways opening up to do it, but traditionally a lot of it has been through networking. Kelly, I know you've got lots of questions, but maybe no, I can add no, one more. I, I don't like to stay on script, so go. Cool. <laughs> I add one more, and that's because I, I do get asked this question. I'm not sure if, if you do, but about what about nonprofit boards as mm -hmm. a way? Mm -hmm. in? And I would say, you know, in terms of building your resume um, and making that be the criteria to get on or the, the thing that gets you onto a board, I'm not sure that really does it. But the thing that nonprofit boards really can do and other types of boards is allows you to work as a peer with people that could be looking for board members. So it creates a different dynamic. Um, with people that you know are in maybe CEOs of companies or, or whatnot, and again back to those relationships and feeling comfortable with people in the boardroom. Culture in the boardroom is so important, right. and so you can say, oh, people used to do the old boys club, but there was a little bit of logic to that. You, the mm -hmm. culture is very important. One person can really disrupt mm -hmm. a boardroom, mm -hmm. and so that I think is the benefit of having some nonprofit experience um, in addition to doing good and giving back to the community um, and I'm not sure you know 
Yeah, you can. totally agree. I agree. No, I totally yeah. agree. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think even to go further, John, to your point, some nonprofits, it makes sense. It's, I think it's more even important who is on that nonprofit yeah. right. more so than it being a nonprofit. And I know as I talk to people in your coaching, a lot of people think, well, they need to start here. And I honestly tell people, wait a minute, you should think about boards here, particularly right. with all that's changing. Um, Cause you only can do so many of these. Right. And you know, when you're not on one, it's hard to say no. But a lot of times I'll advise people, is that really the board for you? I do really right. think you need yeah. to be selective. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you, you have one reputation, you have one brand. And at the beginning, it's the board's choosing you, but you're also choosing the board. Mm -hmm. So I think you, you just need to be conscious of picking the right one, ensuring you've done the vetting of other board members, the company, et cetera. So it is a process. It takes a while, mm -hmm. um, but be very deliberate and be picky. Mm -hmm. I think this is super critical, what Robin mm -hmm. just said, because really when you when you join a board, it's quite a commitment. I mean, so. Joan just said she's been on one for 13 years. It can be like yeah. as long as your career, yeah. you know, so, like and, and you really have to feel yeah. good about Especially, I always like to talk to the CEO first because I'm like, if, yes. I, if I can't get along with the CEO, there's no point in pursuing exactly. this. So I think, you know, those key relationships with management mm -hmm. and then understanding who your colleagues will be on the board and do they share values mm -hmm. with you. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I'm into mission these days, so do they share mission yeah. with you? But for sure, values, core yeah. values, because otherwise, yeah. you know, gosh, life's too short. And, exactly. it, you know, you don't yeah. need that on top of... Yeah. your busy life causing great stress if it's not a good fit. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really important message. So just to reiterate that you don't jump at the first chance. I think women do if they have not been given a lot of seats at the table, proverbial yes. table. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really important yeah. message to highlight. Mm -hmm. You talked a little bit about challenges mm -hmm. on, on boards. Maybe you could talk about what were some other, what were some, I know you can't name the company or, you know, mm -hmm. scrub it, mm -hmm. but what, um, maybe some challenges that you've faced while serving on boards. Um, I, I, I mean, I've, we've removed a CEO, mm -hmm. we've removed a CFO, um, we've had activists join mm -hmm. boards that I've been on, we've had complex M&A and deals not happen, um, change in direction and strategy, you name it, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think Joan mentioned uh, the dynamics of boards and mm -hmm. changes there, so I, I've seen the gamut and it's, it's funny, you see a lot of these things on smaller boards in, in, in a very different way than you do on larger boards. And they take a lot more time, I think, yeah. because of the maturity and the nature of the company. So um, as someone said, these are commitments and every board, every company is going to go through ups and downs and um, the time commitment and the need to really drill in and be prepared when that crisis happens and be committed to helping the company through are, are things to be taken very seriously and not lightly in any way. Mm -hmm. I'm like trying not to smile because I thought maybe you'd talk about some other challenges that maybe, I don't know, alphabet, but you don't have to. <laughs> 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 I, I know. Um, I just was reading about it today. Oh. I, I mean, I would, I would, I would say tick, 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 yeah. you know, the activist shareholder mm -hmm. yeah. changing a CEO. I mean, mm -hmm. there, there's one situation that's in the past and has been public. I won't name the, the company, but, um, where they had doubled in size and mm -hmm. uh, the CEO had been a, a, a deal doer and we mm -hmm. were in the midst of really executing and a couple of major clients had gone bankrupt. And uh, so it was a tough situation and so, and at the same time had an activist shareholder involved. So there's a, so having to go, usually you go through some of these things at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so really both doing your homework but also making sure that you're sitting beside people that you trust mm -hmm. and that can problem solve, that can pivot. Um, that was a really tough situation. Yeah. You know, I was chairing the search committee. We were trying to deal with the activist shareholder. Um, and it ultimately takes a ton of time. Mm -hmm. And so you do need to have some flex in your schedule to be able to commit because you are representing shareholders. That's a very, very important responsibility. Absolutely. Yeah. When you run into issues, 
Um, it does take quite a bit of time commitment because there's a lot of offline meetings and discussions. Mm -hmm. and, and even when everything's great and harmonious, if you're, like I'm audit chair for two of the companies, if you're audit chair, one of the first things I told my CFO is, you know, I think in order to have the committee and the board run smoothly, it's been my experience as a sitting CFO that you get a lot of the work done offline. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of pre-meetings, there's a lot of phone calls, making sure you're on the same page so that by the time you get to the actual board meeting, you actually can get business done and right. approve and agree. Because mm -hmm. the last thing you want is for people to be surprised mm -hmm. in a board meeting and not be able to align and vote and approve something. Right. Um, right. So no, it does take a lot of time. And, and Kelly, not to be specific to Alphabet, but I do think in this evolving world, social responsibility, mm -hmm. stakeholder responsibility, yeah. you can talk about the business roundtable, culture, is becoming something that boards Talents. need to pay more yeah. attention mm -hmm. to. And it is not specific to Alphabet. I think yeah. any fast for sure. growing company, cultures of millennials, um, just changes in directions. I, I think those are new areas back to this continuous learning that boards are starting to have to think about. And it in no way deminimizes the importance of shareholders but I think social responsibility and sustainability, all those mm -hmm. things are things that our shareholders now care about. And um, we spend a lot of time talking about stakeholders and that broadening nice. and boards have to play a part in defining and helping the CEO and the leadership team figure out how do you deal with those multiple stakeholders. Right. Mm -hmm. That's nice. I'm really glad to hear that the discussion is around oh, yeah. stakeholders. Mm -hmm. beyond shareholders. Yeah. You mentioned, and I'm going to go off script, I'm really sorry. I try so hard, but I don't <laughs> succeed. Uh, you talked about activist shareholders, and I, this is just research, so I, I read wild research all the time about gender and diversity on boards, and female CEOs, in fact, receive more activists. Um, mm -hmm. Do you experience mm -hmm. that? I mean, that's what the data says, mm -hmm. that female CEOs will be targeted more mm -hmm. from activists? I don't sit on a board with uh, yeah. female CEOs, so I I do, yeah. but we haven't had an activist. Where we have had an activist, it's a male CEO. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So. The mm -hmm. few that I can think of, even Mary Barr, I, yeah, I think exactly. a lot of them have been put in as CFOs in turnaround situations. Yeah. So I wonder, yeah. is it less about gender and more about the, the way situation. they became the CEO and had to come in and navigate? Mm -hmm. But I, yeah. I, I don't have the data. And I don't want to over-index on research, but the research also talks about yeah. glass cliff. Mm -hmm. where women are often brought in to mm -hmm. right size a shift size. that's gone astray. Yeah. And so I think mm -hmm. that's part of the, the discussion yeah. with Mary Barra. Mm -hmm. but. Yeah. Kelly, I wanted to come back uh, to this challenge question. Um, and, and I think it dovetails really with um, the importance of diversity on the board mm -hmm. that you know, I can almost not think of a business that is not either really pressured to increase their innovation or being disrupted. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, these are really complex problems that, and everything is moving so quickly and it's accelerating. Mm -hmm. And so to have diverse experiences, diverse points of views, diverse, uh, broadly defined diversity at the table is such an asset mm -hmm. for the organization. And um, I just wanted to come back and actually link those two yeah. together um, because we talked about, you know, <laughs> changing out a CEO or mm -hmm. activist shareholders, but there's also just the plain old really tough strategic decisions. I sat on a board that owned 190 newspapers and one of the largest publishing companies in the world. And, um, you know, we all know that's a tough, mm -hmm. tough business, right. right? And how do you, at what point do you decide to disrupt yourself, maybe cannibalize your own business to invest in, in new technologies? Those are really tough decisions that require a lot of judgment. And the more diverse mm -hmm. perspectives you Absolutely. have, um, the better decision that's made. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think of it far less in terms of men and women mm -hmm. than I do in terms of um, diversity of experience. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my companies are involved in retail, wholesale. They're all consumer-branded companies. And, you know, for these companies, supply chain 
has become mm -hmm. so critical with its expectation of free ship, free return, free, 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 everything. So you've got to be super good at supply chain. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I just love, I, I'm so fortunate because I sit on the board with um, the head of the chief supply chain officer at PepsiCo. Mm -hmm. And she just is brilliant and adds so much value and insight slightly different industry, but so many things yeah. still apply. So that functional expertise right. in an area that's so critical, and I know digital marketing is becoming the same mm -hmm. way. So many people are so hungry for digital marketers, mm -hmm. you know, because it's relatively new that from traditional marketing to digital marketing. So I think this diversity of experience mm -hmm. so that when you face these big strategic challenges, mm -hmm. you have the caliber of talent to actually help you think through that is um, really important. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I'm, I'm struggling with knowing so much data that suggests that women are different. Um, but I also want to really honor your experience because I don't have your experience. There's a, there's a statistic that perplexes me greatly, and it says that when women join a board, everybody comes to the meeting more prepared and having done the pre-reads. <laughs> and I just don't, what, what is going on with that? Like, what were they doing before a woman joined the board? Um, and I don't want to, you know, force you into this gender lens, but the research is just really fascinating on things that change. Or when uh, SB 826 passed, there was a, fem a male board member who said, now we're going to have to uh, increase the agenda because there's going to be too much talking at the board meeting. And I just think, oh, you know, oh. any mm. different? I, I just don't. Um, you know, I, I, so it, it's, a tough, it's a tough question <laughs> to answer. Um, Certainly, I haven't faced anything as, as blatant than that. But again, back to this point, we, we all come to the table with Something different like experiences. And as a white woman, I come with certain sets of experiences, and I'm a mom. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I am going to look at things differently. And maybe I have faced some tough times early in my career trying to get going and some you know, older mm -hmm. guy making a comment. So maybe I've had those lived experiences that when I'm sitting, let's say, at the table and we're talking about talent, maybe I'm going to mm -hmm. listen more carefully or maybe think, maybe there's another side to this story. So in that sense, that's back to the broader diversity. We all come with different experiences right. mm -hmm. and we're going to you know, use those experiences. And, and we also come to the table with different biases and exactly. we need to uh, try and check our biases as well and be you know, right. really understand that we yeah. have them. So, yeah. so it's a more maybe subtle, subtle. answer yeah. Yeah, no, to your fair. question, but I do think, yeah. you know. I agree with that. No. Yeah. I, I mean, as I sit at table with men and women, I think you're at that table because you have skill sets and mm -hmm. deep expertise or varying expertise that adds. And, and I don't think anyone's there simply because of their color or their skin or, mm -hmm. or their gender. But to Joan's point, I think the perspective and, you know, I come at it from a different cultural perspective yeah. than she does. I, re I recall a discussion where we were talking about a leadership team with the elevation of one woman, woman to a very senior role and, and th things weren't perfect. And I, I, I mean, there were other women there, but to say, have you thought about getting them a coach? Or have, you thought, mm -hmm. have you thought about the ramifications of ensuring that they're successful mm -hmm. and they're not so you you do and that that had nothing to do with my gender right but it's just okay i'm thinking about it from their perspective as being the only one yeah. mm -hmm. and how that may be perceived and what can we do to ensure that we're supportive obviously holding to a standard but maybe there are some things we can do proactively right. to better ensure success because the, the opportunity to fail may have broader implications. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think, in, and I don't think I had to be a woman to say that. I mean, mm -hmm. I think all the men around the table were agreeing, but um, I, I, it is, it's that melting pot yeah. of experience. And I think that is, you, you know, that's the creme de la creme. When you get that, mm -hmm. you're not missing anything at the, at the table when, when everyone's coming at it with other, versus if everyone comes at it from one perspective, you're one dimensional. And I think more and more you need to be multi-dimensional right. to be successful. Mm -hmm. But maybe very specifically to your point, Kelly, and it's a, it's a tricky question because I don't want to be supporting stereotypes, yeah. you know, but I, and I think, and I really think this is going to change quickly mm -hmm. with millennials and Gen Z and, you know, but, but I, but just maybe to validate a little bit what your data suggests 
is I do think women of my generation perhaps felt like, whether real or perceived, felt like, I, I'll just speak for myself, I felt like I had to work like twice as hard <laughs> as the guy next to me. And you know, this, this applies to my maternity leaves and everything, which were like non-existent maternity leaves, because like I didn't want to be gone. Yeah, you know, like yeah. I have to be in it or they'll think I'm on some mommy track. Or, so right. I think women of my generation and me yeah. specifically have always held ourselves to this much higher standard. Mm -hmm. And I still like, you know, we get these 300 page board books and I read every word. Mm -hmm. And like, ah, if I had a guess, maybe everybody doesn't read every word. And I'm not <laughs> gonna say if that's a man or a woman, yeah, but yeah. you know what I mean? You mm -hmm. can see the difference. And I think, I think at least for me and my generation, there's just this higher bar mm -hmm. um, that we set for ourselves. I'm not saying it's men's fault or they imposed it on us. I'm just saying okay. we set it for ourselves. Yeah. So I, I think that I can no, see I where that's true. That's vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I love men. So I don't, yeah. I never <laughs> point fingers at men because we women are complicit of, we're all biased. Mm -hmm. We're all racist. Right. We all got our product of the same systems. But I, I appreciate the vulnerability on that because I think it is harder for women who have had to fight and claw their way up there and the sl slots were fewer. Yeah. You do have to adjust your right. behavior. But, but I also think there's a comfort, comfortableness of when you get there more than in the past, yeah. where you see these women leaders bringing along other, I can tell mm -hmm. you a time when I think the women leaders at the top were fearful of, okay, supporting and supporting women. Yeah. And I really try to create a culture, to your point, mm -hmm. of Pay not forward. feeling com comfortable leaving early or going to something to setting an example in a very public That's way. Right. So not only women, but men can be free to leave early or to let me know, I need to go pick up my kid, but I'll get on the phone with you. So, so I think it's so important, whether it's the boardroom, the C-suite, more senior levels to have diversity, because I think then people will all be more vulnerable yeah. and create an environment that's safer for everyone, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Because they see people that look like yeah. them that are experiencing yeah. different things. So we have to continue to go for it and, mm -hmm. and fight through this. And when you get there, you have to set a different example to change how these things are perceived. Right. I love this point, and if, and, and if not an example, because I'll just admit I was a horrible example, but, but if not an example, and the woman I love that has worked for me for years is sitting in the back, so she knows. But, 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 <laughs> if, not not admit an, that. but if not an example, I try like overtly and super hard when I see women who mm -hmm. maybe just had a child mm -hmm. or are struggling mm -hmm. to offer them like go part time. Exactly. Let's figure it out. Yeah. Like, don't leave. You don't need to leave. You're super talented. Yeah, exactly. So let's find a creative solution exactly. to work through this tough period. Right. And um, and I think that's, that's how we sort of progress, Absolutely. right? Mm -hmm. In supporting yeah. each other. The loyalty, in that way. Yeah. their yeah. ability to then, you know, we had a similar example. Let her work, and she came back and just really rose to so higher grateful. echelons. Mm -hmm. and and yeah. yeah, it's it's so important to do and it is important to, as a leader to let people see your vulnerability and that you deal with the same issues mm -hmm. that they do mm -hmm. right? that's mm -hmm. what makes them think they can make it yeah because you Absolutely. made it yeah exactly. I, sabrina i don't know if you remember this genevieve my colleague and i wrote a, a case on gap inc and mm -hmm. the culture gap has mm -hmm. zero pay gap and we interviewed you and you talked about that story and it was just really profound because what we what we found was that it wasn't equal pay that was the outcome. It was the culture of equity mm -hmm. that was the impetus. And so that mm -hmm. was a fantastic, um, I was in your office and I remember, you, I think you were your last week too, so. Oh yeah, it was, it was close to it was end. The yeah, things that we, true. I remember. Um, I wanna move to Q&A in a moment, but maybe how, how do, you already touched on this, so if there's anything additive to say about how to get more women and people of color, because it's not just about women, it's men of color as well. What are some strategies that you employ, that you have seen employed, and how do we diversify? And I, I get different experiences as well, but really for, for this particular topic, we're focusing more on diversity of gender, color, ethnicity. Mm -hmm. um, gender is a spectrum. I, you know, I don't know. That is a really big thing that I think when I am in the classroom, I listen to my students and how much they, you know, gender non-binary, and they don't like my research because it's gender as a binary. Here's what men, here's what women. I just don't know if companies are ready for this. 
Well, you know, fundamentally what we're talking about is culture change. Yeah. And um, I've done a lot of work with culture change in the transformation work mm -hmm. I've, I've done. And it's a piece. And people always say, oh, that's the soft stuff. It's actually hard stuff. There's soft stuff with yeah. it, but there's really hard stuff mm -hmm. you can do. And you can take that same model and apply it to basically the board ecosystem or the right. business ecosystem. Right. And so, I, so I'll try and make a, what could be a complex answer a, a s simple which is, I think you've got to hit it from all, all yeah. aspects, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. I do think looking at um, you know, regulatory side in Canada, for example, mm -hmm. um, they looked, uh, I was advising the prime minister on women on boards. And um, we recommended that we change the disclosure, that you, through your disclosure, you have to say what your plan is. So you could say, I want one woman on board, or you mm. could say, I want 50%. And you have to report against it. Mm. And so just in the process of saying, you have to say what you're going to do and report against it, you start to see change. So there's that piece. Yeah. I think the peer-to-peer -peer pressure and, um, mm and maybe the carrot and the stick a little bit <laughs> yeah. is really is very important. And also getting the data um, mm -hmm. out there and having more women on nominating committees right. because mm -hmm. it's back to that mm -hmm. and it's a really important factor. The culture of the board is very important. Mm -hmm. And so having more um, diversity on the nominating yeah, committee, sure. that's kind of from an ecosystem perspective. And then women have to, and diverse candidates have to do their piece. And we've talked a little bit about how, how you might do that. Um, but there is, there's a there's great supply, right? Yeah. And we've yeah. got to get the demand um, so that there's more linkage. So how would you feel about counseling our prime minister on this? <laughs> Next. I'll just. I know. It's so hard not to go there. Oh, I mean, I think I think two things that are really um, simple. There's the complex, which mm -hmm. are structural, and those need to be addressed. And I think pushing for reporting and transparency, especially, yeah. especially in areas like pay equity, will go a long way toward that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think simply each of us, right, we have a network of people. And so when we feel confident that someone is mm -hmm. superb and amazing and, um, you know, introduce them to people. And even if you introduce them like informational, because, you know, um, sometimes these things take five years to work out, mm -hmm. you know, because yeah. there's lots of boards that you know, the, the turnover is pretty slow. So, you, you know, you're just sowing seeds. And that sort of segues into my point number two, which I think what would help a lot is for individuals to impose on themselves term limits and or mm. companies to consider um, terming people out. Yeah. Because I think part of the reason the progress is so slow is because mm -hmm. people stay will stay on a board for you know 25 years mm -hmm. and and so there's not a lot of turn mm -hmm. so i think if you had more you know term limits um you could refresh the board more and i think there would just naturally be more turn and people are more open-minded to it as we've yeah. all said so you'd see more progress i think yeah. mm -hmm. what's gonna what's gonna make term limits happen well i it's a good question. I think, like for me personally, I would just self-impose it. Right. It's kind of like how you fire yourself. Like I sort of fired myself from my job. I'm like, I've done it long enough. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not fresh and exciting mm -hmm. anymore. I'm not excited. So I exactly. need to fire myself. And I think the same thing goes for boards. Like you get yeah. to a point of like, am I contributing enough? Mm -hmm. Am I fresh enough? Am I, you know, is it somebody else's turn? And that's, you know, it's hard and scary to kind of fire yourself, right? Yeah. But it's it's exciting, too, because, yeah. you know, one door closes and another yeah. one opens sort mm -hmm. of thing. Yeah. yeah. Now, I wholeheartedly agree with the comments that are made, but I'd only add, I think there's also a mindset. It's interesting to me, and I'm on all these D-lists, X number of women on boards plus X number of men, and I, I think this idea that it's this set fixed pool mm -hmm. is incorrect. You know, mm -hmm. one doesn't win and one doesn't lose. Right. I think the diversity makes companies better. It allows us to create more innovation and more companies. So there's opportunity for everyone. And I, and, but, but I also think when you're in the boardroom, ensuring that that mindset around the skill sets needed is to your point, it's fresh, it's mm -hmm. new. Um, 
you're presenting different candidates um, and, and different ways of thinking and really validating and highlighting to that CEO. I mean, I can think of the uh, Mark Benioff at Salesforce, his mindset around the importance of diversity, inclusion, and, and equality, and fair, it's yeah. core to the culture, mm -hmm. right? And I think the more you have that, you set yourself up to really create this appropriate baseline. But to Sabrina's point, you know, I have a responsibility account, but I only can be on so many boards, but right. people are always looking for financial experts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I make it a point, if there are any CFOs or controllers, you know, to know as many as I can. And I've had conversations about boards when someone said, well, no, I need a sitting CFO. It's like, well, you really don't. This treasurer with this type of experience and background, and that person got on a board. So yeah. the better I am at networking and mm -hmm. knowing a little bit about right. people, the better, I, the better I can do that. And I've also, candidly, when search firms come and talk to me, I would say, well, have you talked to XX and X? Mm -hmm. Why do you talk to the same people, right? Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. you can... You can use your power to nudge and appropriately pay it forward and make a, a, a difference. But I agree, it's a little bit of all those things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Managing the life cycle, I think, is very important. You know, term limits or, or aging, you know, three or four years, you can be very deliberate and start to think about what type of skill set should right. we be looking um, at or what type of people should we be introducing to some of the yeah. board members to just get them on their radar mm -hmm. and figure out ways to um, ensure that they're more accessible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's so many, you know, these type of organizations, networking organizations. Um, I'm involved in a few initiatives where we're really focused on enhancing the number of black directors, mm -hmm. you know, male and female. But I think all of those things are important and just when you become a board member or when you're in a C-suite, I think you need to be part of that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. where, can you con where can you contribute? Yeah, it's so great to hear the lift as you climb. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I've kind, of yeah. more, I've kind of tweaked it with, with my teaching, one plus one plus one. So everybody yeah. lift that looks like you, lift somebody who doesn't look like you. Exactly. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to move over to you all for Q&A. There are mics on either side of the room. So if you could go to a mic, it just helps everybody in the room hear the question. And maybe if you give us your name and what you're, you know, where you are now. <coughs> We're going to, okay. Hi, um, my name is Crystal Milo. I am on the board of um, Financial Women of San Francisco, actually the VP of Diversity and Inclusion. Mm -hmm. But I'm also director of research at Glass Lewis, a proxy advisory mm -hmm. firm. Um, and my question to you is about um, going beyond diversity and inclusion. Um, maybe if you can speak to the challenges you've had about um, belonging, about in your, you might have been the first woman on some of these boards. Um, what steps have you taken to really ensure that you belong and to create that um, uh, culture of belonging for future women and diverse people on your board? Yeah, that's a, do you want to start or do you want to stay? I, so I'll start, but I, I, I mean, I, I'll say, <laughs> You're I, um, like this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I don't say this anyway, I think one of the things I've just learned through my career is that sometimes I can be my own worst enemy. And I think everyone has these points of time where you don't feel competent, where you're nervous, and you kind of have to like push it aside. And you got there because you know what you need to do, right? You're there because you deserve to be in the room. And I think you have to have, and it doesn't mean you're gonna do everything right. Um, but besides reading the 300 pages, <laughs> uh, it's, what questions am I gonna ask? Um, you know how many times you had a question and you're a little hesitant and then someone asked your question? So right. that was a great idea. It's like, why didn't I ask that question? So I think just putting yourself out there sometimes and yeah, it is different. I, I play this game when I speak because a lot of times particularly as a CFO, you're in this crowd and there's no one out there that looks like you. And so for me, it becomes this mental game to, I gotta be the best presenter I can be so they all know that everyone that looks like me can do this, right? Mm -hmm. So I, 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 so it's not perfect, yeah, it's lonely, but I mean, I also learned you can have a conversation with any, I can have a conversation with anyone. So I, I do find the more that I embrace my own confidence and mm -hmm. sense of self, and comfortableness with myself. I can't control how others view me, 
um, I can only control how I react to it. And if I'm focused on that, the other stuff you eventually kind of get over it and move on and add your value. So, yeah. I love that answer. Um, <laughs> it's great. Yeah, I, I think I won't speak about the boardroom per se, but earlier in my career, you know, learning what things, if there's an uncomfortable situation, because sometimes they come up and sometimes they're unintended. Mm -hmm. And so being able to kind of step back a little bit in the moment and find out what's your mode to maybe diffuse a situation. Um, and, you know, I, I even talk to my kids still about this, is finding the value of humor. Exactly. And I don't mean like a roaring joke, but just kind of, you know, okay, I heard that. It's yes. Yes. I heard that, but we're just yeah. going to make a little joke and move on. Um, you know, I think about that earlier in my career. I think, you know, the question about now, present time in a boardroom, I think a lot about... Uh, diverse people that come into the boardroom, some of the boardrooms that still look, unfortunately, pretty homogeneous. And I just make eye contact, I smile, mm -hmm. I make sure I take a moment to say a few words to them because I remember being earlier in my career and being mm -hmm. really frightened to go into the boardroom. Right. And sometimes that fear is, to Robin's point, a little higher if you feel like you don't really belong. Yeah. And um, so I'm comfortable there. I feel comfortable, but I do remember a time when I didn't maybe feel so comfortable. Mm -hmm. So that's just a very personal thing that I do. Yeah. Right side. Hi, I'm Carrie Halmy. I'm an executive coach, and I run a leadership, a women's leadership program. And go blue! I went to Michigan oh, also. Nice. <laughs> um, so. Because I run a women's leadership program and work on that a lot, um, I have a lot of discussions with men about women's leadership. Mm -hmm. And something that has come up shockingly recently from three men at least, um, who at least two of them I've thought to be supportive of women, has been around, well, if I hire a woman, um, I'm not looking at merit enough. You know, like somehow they're lowering their standards or I can't you know, this woman isn't performing, but I can't do anything because she's a woman, or I can't. So very, like a backlash. That, I know, you're looking at me like, how could that be? Unbelievable. Yeah. I know, and it's still <laughs> happening. And so my question is around, you know, with the new law coming out requiring women to be on board, do you think there's going to be a backlash? Um, and or if you've seen that, how have you dealt with it? I, you know what? I, I think we're super lucky that we live in such a progressive mm -hmm. state, yeah, first of true. all. Like, I'm not even positive this law is legally enforceable, but <laughs> I like the spirit of it. I'm not, I mean, I've talked to lawyers. I'm not, who can, and who cares? Because the spirit of it is the yeah, right spirit, exactly. and I think people are embracing it. Um, so my point was, like, it doesn't even matter if it's legally enforceable. I think it was good to shine a bright light on it, mm -hmm. and I think it's really important for people. Sometimes, I don't know, I'm just kind of a cup half full yeah. person, mm -hmm. and I actually think most people are really good and really well-intended, and I, you know, men have been my champions, mm -hmm. like, yeah. totally my champions my whole career. So I think sometimes it's just an awareness thing, um, and I think people are really embracing it and trying to figure out how they can actually increase the diversity and support people. I, I think your story, I don't deny it at all, but I hope it's a vast minority of people yeah. because really the men I encounter are, are, um, are really open-minded and trying to support creating uh, healthy and healthy, diverse environments, because I think they understand that that benefits everyone, as we've been talking about. So, um, yeah. I would just maybe add one quick thing on that is knowledge is power and information is power. And there's some great research now around, um, you know, the importance of diversity on performance and there's just great stuff and so to just have some of that data at your fingertips yeah. Yeah. is really is really on handy. our website yeah. yes no and, and thank but you I, I, I remember this came up when we were looking at hiring in my team you know i'm a female cfo i had an all-white male team and I, I got very deliberate about a women in finance event and i got pushback from someone not directly to me but there was whispering 
right. said, okay, let's just show the numbers. And, you know, in total it was 50, but as you started to look up, the numbers were different. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and I just said, what do you guys think about this? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't view myself as the only advocate for DNI. I hold my team accountable for it. So this year it's like, okay, I want you all to go out and not only look at your numbers, but think about an opportunity to create a diverse event that you go to and that you bring diverse candidates or you represent our company in those environments. So it can be done, mm -hmm. but they're, they're, and the other thing I'd say, there's dinosaurs out there and eventually they're gonna die. And you just gotta move on. I mean, they exist. Yeah. 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 That's true. Yeah. Yes. Well, well, yeah, well, I do we, have hope, so thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. for sure. I'm looking at Alex, my student. We had a speaker who, I won't, she won't remain on name, but she's an expert in boards. She came to our class. I think last week, Alex, remember, um, our speaker. And she, she used the phrase, and everybody just cracked up. Male, pale, and stale. And was it you that said, could we just add Yale? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was such a great moment. Um, we're going to go to you. Hi, thank you so much to the four of you for being here tonight. Um, I'm Jennifer. I'm exchange student, Russian-German exchange student here at Haas. Um, also aspiring social entrepreneur. So my question for you is actually, first of all, you mentioned what I really loved, being vulnerable as a leader. Just two days ago, I was reading an article where a woman who rose into a leadership position said that she was sharing a lot of like vulnerable stuff and it backfired. So my question for you, because she was not ta being taken seriously, and I don't know, my question is just for you, do you actively and consciously um, try to be vulnerable? And just second, very quick question is like, it feels like often when we talk about diversity, one dimension we leave out is socioeconomic background. And I was wondering what's your take on this and um, yeah, what your experiences are with this. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe I'll start on that. You know, I, I don't actively think, oh, I'm gonna be vulnerable in this situation, but I do think about, my authentic self, mm -hmm. you know, who am I? I'm bringing my whole mm -hmm. self to this. Um, and a lot of organizations and financial services organizations in particular um, are very, I'd call it, uh, very kind of IQ oriented mm -hmm. organizations. You've been to academia? <laughs> <laughs> and, and you need to bring yeah. your emotional self too. So mm -hmm. you need to bring your whole self and be your authentic self. And so I think if people are consciously thinking, oh, I'm gonna be vulnerable in this situation, you also have to be professional. You're in a professional mm -hmm. environment, yeah. mm -hmm. and so yeah. sharing things that maybe aren't appropriate in a, in a um, you know, business environment, that's not, I think, what people mean when they're talking about vulnerability. It's really about bringing your emotional self, your intellectual self, um, mm -hmm. to the table and being authentic. Um, so I'll, I'll hundred percent agree. Yeah. yeah, no, I 100%. totally agree. I'd only add on your socioeconomic um, exposure. I think is so important, and I'm very passionate about how do you ensure that people from all backgrounds. I mean, I think education is the great mm -hmm. multiplier that yeah. levels mm -hmm. that. But clearly, getting to that point and getting that exposure is is so important. And I, I think it's so important to our learning environment. If we're only teaching, you know, it's at Haas or whatever, in a home meal, Jeannie, but that's not the world. I mean, you're an international exchange student. I have a son that's in Spain right now studying. And I, I just think this next generation's gonna change it. I think these kids from California are gonna change it. But back, back to, I mean, you, 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 you do have to reach it. Yeah, you have to, you have to um, I, I think you just have to reach out and be sure that what you're doing is is taking those kids or that kid that maybe don't have that exposure. How do I how do I get that or how do I come in these communities and give back? Because um, unless we have that better equality, I mean, all of us are the entire world is going to be behind unless we get there. So it's really important. Well, thank God for our public universities. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. because mm -hmm. I mean mm -hmm. they're like a great equalizer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like super amazing. I mean, we got Michigan, we got Berkeley. I mean, they're amazing yeah. at like really, this is what America should be, right? Just oh, yeah. democratizing Although education. Although even there are certain laws that don't, that are impacting their ability to be 
multiplied. Prop 209. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Our I get Michigan. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But Michigan's in a far yes. job. But that, it's be very quite, sad. I can't but think of a private, private school. I agree. No, it's yeah. Yeah. still yeah. terrible. I know. It's a great job. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go to. I'm going to try to get through as many questions as possible. So. Sure. So um, my name is Kirsten Metzel, and I'm working at a fintech startup in the finance function as the finance executive. And I want to just attest to the fact that Joan does acknowledge people who walk in the boardroom who look and sound differently than a lot of the other people in the room. So thank you for doing that. Um, and my question relates to positioning yourself for a board uh, role. So I'm looking at all three of the examples that are up here and thinking about we've got kind of biotech and tech as a CFO person. We've got a retail you know, whether it's Gap or I've forgotten the other, the boards mm -hmm. that you're on, but grew Columbia. up in the CFO role, mm -hmm. yeah. and we've got financial services. How do we think about, as an example, if I'm a financial services person, maybe I want to be on a different industry board. Should I only be thinking about banks, or should mm -hmm. I be thinking about mm -hmm. a transportation company or something else, you know, FedEx, or um, much smaller probably at this point in my life, but um, so, how do, how do we think about that? So I don't want to think about diversity inclusion. I just want to think, how do we get the women in this room on boards? Do we have to think about the industry we come from, or can we be agnostic about that? That's a really good question. Okay. Kirsten, we're going to, we have a walk coming yes, up, we so do. we're going to have a longer conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I'll, get, I'll start since I, I know uh, your background. I mean, I think clearly, you know, the major industries that you've been in, that's a that's an obvious place to start. But then look at the skill sets that go horizontally to that. Um, so for example, financial services, you've worked in a regulated environment. Mm -hmm. So you understand that. It depends, you know, how closely you've been aligned with that in the job that you've had. But you can use that skill set to talk to a board about being somebody that's going to be savvy about how mm -hmm. do you deal with regulators, how do you think about that, what kind mm -hmm. of relationships do you mm -hmm. need, et cetera. Um, there's also just the, the what I'd call the, the basic uh, qualifications, which is understanding what happens in a boardroom, um, you know, being team oriented, all those kinds of things. But I think thinking about both industry and then what are those kind of skill sets that might go across. Exactly. Um, and I think that's that's maybe a helpful way to think about it. Yeah. But since we're going to have a longer talk, I'll end. <laughs> yeah. No, I, yeah. I mean, I think this is right on. I, I think it's just that I always just think of it when I'm having conversations with people about boards, I just keep going back to the win-win. And it's like, you know, how can I contribute? Well, they always want me as a financial expert, you know, for, you know, not always actually, but yeah. mostly they want me as a financial expert. But then like, I want to, I want to contribute more than that. Mm -hmm. You know, like I want to contribute to strategy. I want to be in the bigger discussion, not just audit committee. So, so, you know, this is part of the self-selection exactly. process too. Yeah. And like, where do you feel that nice, um, combination? of you contributing meaningfully and you learning. Exactly. And so you use all the tools that Joan laid out, but you sort of, that's how you, I think, get through it and I decipher agree. what makes sense. I totally agree. I mean, to your point of industry, and I like the way you're thinking FedEx, start start up here, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a great point. I mean, all we about supply be. chain, right, yeah. and optimization. But I, I mean, I agree with, um, first of all, I won't join a board as the audit chair right away. I will just say, because I really want to learn the company. Mm -hmm. um, I purposely don't join the same industry that I'm in because I never want a conflict. So mm -hmm. I have not been on a healthcare while I was a healthcare CFO because I just, I don't like the optics of that. I joined an industrial, which was totally different, but I like that they operate business units and they were a serial acquirer. And so I thought that M&A experience would help me. So I agree, is it a win-win? Am I gonna learn? Are there industries that I'm interested in? Because I'm gonna have to immerse myself in those industries. And to experience, I agree, P&L experience, international experience, mm -hmm. crisis management, mm -hmm. um, business transformation. Mm -hmm. Have you taken on those big, ugly, hairy projects that get you in front of the board irrespective of you're the CFO? or controller. So put yourself in those positions of things that you can talk not about the company you work for, but these are the things that I accomplished. I saved the company 20 billion. I added X percent of EPS. 
I helped on multi, you know, multiple, whatever those things are. So that's how boards look at skill sets. Mm -hmm. right. I'm gonna move fast. So short questions, yeah. short, answers, short answers so we can get yeah. everybody. Okay. Hi, I'm Darlene Crane and my company is The Crane Works. And I actually focus on growing diverse businesses um, women minority businesses over a million dollars and that's the fastest growing sectors of independent businesses are women and minorities because they feel they have no future in corporations they come in and we know that there's uh, there's only very few jobs mm -hmm. at uh, the levels that took you to boards so McKinsey has this great wor word called a shedding of women minorities out of management at all levels starts very early. So tell us your are, question. Tell well, us your my question is how are boards are boards even dealing with that level or are they only are you primarily concerned at this point of just uh, of, uh, diversifying the board positions? I think you're losing talent. Do you want to keep so do you want to retain your talent? Did you understand the question? No, I, it, it, are you asking about talent throughout the organization? To talent Whether throughout the organization. About that? Yeah. yeah. How is it recognized? I mean because yeah. people feel buried. Well, I, I, if, if I understand the, correct, the, uh, the uh, question, excuse mm -hmm. me, I'll just take a quick crack at it, which is um, the boards I'm involved in, the companies I'm involved in, they take talent management very seriously, and uh, diversity is valued, and so there is a real concrete um, discussion about that, and um, both in terms of you know, how it plays out and the way people interact, the way they maybe communicate, all of those things. Um, and also in terms of thinking about what kind of stretch op opportunities are there, um, et cetera. So, so that's my experience is that people do take it very seriously. Is there more work to do? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And there's a recognition that there's more work to do. Mm -hmm. all right. Jump to the right. Hi. My name is Kim. I'm the CEO of a nonprofit organization, and I've also been on a lot of nonprofit boards. I'm going to adjust my question a little bit because, um, Sabrina, I think you started to talk about. I want to talk about managing change and term limits. Um, some of the best practices, at least for governance on nonprofit boards, is term limits and such. And um, so I was curious whether that was the mechanism on the corporate board. You kind of answered that question. Um, I know as a, a CEO, I've managed people off of boards. You know before their terms were off and so forth, to, to create that new space, that mm -hmm. fresh space. Um, another mechanism is also for people to come on a board are to have committee chairships or working on committees that are not board. So my question is uh, twofold. One, is there a similar mechanism in corporate boards, on corporate boards where there are committees where you get a sense of what's going on in the board, they can check you out, you can check them out. Mm -hmm. And then um, secondly, how do you manage people on and off the board? How do you manage transitions when you, it sounds like there aren't term limits on boards? There certainly has been blood. lots of transitions on the boards I've been on um, for various reasons we won't get into. Mm -hmm. But yes, I mean, there's definitely turn. So it's not just term limits that will drive that. A lot of times it's just the dynamics and what you need and um, people are can be very good, chairmen and CEOs can be very good with their nom and gov committees of, of initiating change. So it can happen. I just have also observed that oftentimes, you know, it's helpful to have some kind of limits um, and I think they're controversial because you can ask people to leave, you know, and so, so, so it's kind of like saying, well, why do I need the term limit if I'm actively managing my board? I can actually actively, man and I've seen that. Mm -hmm. so, so I think it would be helpful on the margin, but I also think that um, boards, as we evaluate ourselves mm -hmm. and we have discussions about who's contributing, who, you know, you can actually enact that change without formalizing term limits as well. Mm -hmm. Another part was about, do you, are there, is there a structure committees. like committees mm -hmm. and such that sort of onboard people where they can take a look at each other, kind of date before you get married? Do you? <laughs> That's for a corporate, for, not, a, not for a public boards. board, not for a not. For public. Like committees that come? Yeah, she's, no, she's wondering, can so. you enter a committee 
as a public board. So you're not yeah. technically on oh, the board, no, no, but you're no. part Can't of you a working that's committee. Not Can you be an observer? It's not an yeah. analyst. Yeah. That's, I, I don't, General, that's no. not the norm. No, no. normally no. you have to be elected to a board. I mean, there are consultants to yeah. group or advisors sometimes, or particularly for smaller companies where you can have a board of advisors, which is different than your actual yeah. board. But that's yeah. usually... Yeah. Not the you, you're elected to the board and then you're put on a committee. A committee. Yeah, or these are you know these are public companies, so yeah. the confidentiality obviously yeah. is really important. So we have five minutes. We're going to go two more. So Alex, you don't get extra credit in class, but go with your question. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alex. I'm a second year student in Haas in Kelly's class, and we're researching um, non-compliance with SB 826 right now. So you've offered some incredible advice about that. I think we can bring back to the companies. I'm curious, a if you have anything additional. We hear a lot about pipeline being an issue, and that's clearly not the case looking here too. Um, do you have any additional responses to kind of pipeline for non-compliant companies? And then the second part is, um, you mentioned kind of supply chain and digital marketing as industries in addition to skill sets that you think as you look towards the future. Are there any other ones that you think will start to come up more frequently on boards in terms of like looking towards adding additional roles? Thanks. Cybersecurity. Huge. <laughs> every, Huge. every board I would say it's, yeah. Not, if it's not number one, it's number two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was the second question? Just any, we're interviewing non-compliant companies, and so oh, is there oh. any additional advice that you'd have if they don't have women on their board? Tra I think this right transparency now. idea oh, yeah. of forcing reporting, like mm -hmm. I actually wish I could name the companies who are non-compliant, but I don't, I actually can't. Yeah. But it, the more I think that we focus on, like, who are they? They should be put in the paper. And just, there was an article recently, I think, mm -hmm. somebody yeah. told yeah. me about. I, I've seen one long ago, but kind of top of mind, like, yeah. and why aren't you making progress? Or, you know, I think, I think reporting is a really healthy, yeah. and transparency mm -hmm. is very healthy. Mm -hmm. And self-reporting in particular, yeah. where, you know, if you want to say, as I said, we want one per, you know, that says something about you as well, exactly. but yeah. then having to report against that, right? Mm -hmm. So We can mm -hmm. all make things transparent. We don't have to wait for the newspaper. So, yeah. last question, no pressure. Thanks. Uh, my name is Lindsay Gray. I'm the corporate controller at Grocery Outlet, so just down the, down nice. the way. So, quick question. Um, so I love talking with our board members when I can find them. Um, it was a little daunting at first, but I love getting to know them. But I find that a lot of other folks find it very threatening or they feel uncomfortable approaching a board member, female or male. So I was wondering, just you specifically in seeing your board members, how often are you reaching out or folks reaching out to you and how much, I guess, interaction is appropriate between people who work at the company and the board from either a mentoring perspective or just casual conversations? That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. I know on a couple of my boards, um, they've got me involved in their ERGs or to speak to their women. Um, one of the things that they do a good job of is having a dinner and they will bring one or two key guests a couple levels down mm -hmm. and have them do like literally a 10 minute presentation. You get to talk with them. But also, I mean, as an employee, talk to your um, boss about, hey, I'd do you, would, would it be okay if I reach out to that board member when they're here on campus? Because there's usually time and just spend 30 minutes with them. One of the things that I do as a CFO, I have kind of an annual meeting and I will bring in board members where everyone gets a chance to hear from them and people love it. It's one of the most liked sessions. So if you do those type of things as a controller, you know, ask your CFO, hey, can I invite our audit chair? to come meet and talk with my team, which gives you a great opportunity to interview that person. And you know, you get a twofer, right? Your employees are happy and you get to have one-on-one -on -one time with the audit chair. But I, I think it's just being creative, but most people love to do that stuff. Mm -hmm. right? I would, yeah, but I would yeah. work through your management yeah, team definitely, because yeah. um, like I'm up for anything almost when I get asked. I yeah. do all these things too, like have breakfasts and blah, blah, yeah. blah. But, but I would never, um, reach out without yes. letting the CEO know yes. mm -hmm. why, what I was up to. That would be awkward for a board, you know, and, and I want to be respectful of the yeah. CEO and their mm -hmm. management of the, because we're not there to manage the company, you know. Right. So so I would work through the management team and request it, and I bet you you'll find they're really open, and your board members will probably be really open. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to turn it over to Sue, but one thing I was remiss in saying about EGAL, I'm really proud of our Center for Equity, Gender, and Leadership. We have a partnership with BoardList. And mm -hmm. BoardList is a place where companies can go on to look for 
board members, and then board members can get nominated so that they are on this list, not self-nominated, but Haas will nominate our alums, and you know we vet and whatnot. So we're really excited to offer that to our alums, and want to let you know that, that that's a great Haas pipeline. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Sue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, first, a huge thank you to Kelly for, for leading the discussion tonight, and of course to Joan, Sabrina, and Robin for your authenticity, mm -hmm. your candidness. Um, clearly, we've all learned a lot and appreciate your time and wisdom. Um, on behalf of Financial Women of San Francisco, we're going to award each of you a year of membership to our organization. <laughs> So we hope that you will come to some of our events um, and, and enjoy that, that um, camaraderie that we all share. Um, and then Haas has a little gift for you as well, which we'll award you as well. Um, it's a public institution. Get excited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, I did just want to mention a couple of great events that we have coming up as well. Um, for those of you who are members or are about to join and become a member, we have our annual holiday party on December 4th, which will be um, at the offices of Robert Half in San Francisco. We do an auction at that event to raise money for our endowment, which supports our scholarship mission as well. Um, then, hot off the press, on January 30th, and Kelly might not even know this yet, um, Dean Harrison from here at Haas is going to be our presenter at an Economic Outlook event. Oh, nice. um, the event will be a breakfast event at the City Club in San Francisco. So we are thrilled, as I said, with this partnership we have with Haas, mm -hmm. and now to have your dean be speaking to us as well. Um, and then the third event that I want to mention um, is our International Women's Day event, which will be on March 5th. It's a Thursday. International Women's Day is actually on a Sunday, but we thought everyone would uh, maybe be a little more available during the week. Um, it's a half day event. This is our third year of putting on um, this event. Our keynote is Rosie Rios, who yeah. was the 40, 43rd treasurer of the United States under Barack Obama, and I believe a Haas alum Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. 